contending for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. This is what this channel is all about. Today, I am going to refute offshoot ministry punchlines in defense of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. You can't afford to miss this presentation and receive the instruction necessary to vehemently defend the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Christ's wonderful bride. Now, there are certain punchlines, certain phrases, certain charges that are used to attack the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The first being, and the most simplest I think to refute, is the Seventh-day Adventist Church is Babylon. Now, this is usually coming from Adventists. Adventists slinging at Adventists. Offshoot ministries and ministers, independent ministries who are antagonistic to the church, say that, well, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is Babylon. And often these ministries uphold and uplift the writings of Ellen G. White. Well, if one were to do the research, which I think they are either purposely neglecting, well, the truth of the matter is, Ellen White frequently refers to the fact that the Seventh-day Adventist Church never will be Babylon. There were, per there were people in Ellen White's day who were saying that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is Babylon. And she had over and over and over again refuted that, saying that anyone who would come and have a message such as that is not from God. Now, that's an easy one. We can look at Ellen G. White's writings for those references. Another one is that the Adventist church has become lax in its standards, practices, and devotion to God, and they will say that we are the emergent reformatory movement spoken of by the spirit of prophecy. In other words, they're better, they're in the know, and the Seventh-day Adventist church is totally backslidden, and their role is to draw people from it into their holier-than-thou movement. Now, this is important to note that we have what's called a church manual. And in that church manual near the back, we have the doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, including the standards. Now, to say that somehow the church has become lax in its standards, meanwhile, in our church manual, and of course, in our conference-wide and church-wide globally, having these studies, Bible studies, on standards, to say that all of a sudden that we're lax in standards, we're not teaching the standards, and that our practices and devotion to God are waning and lacking, those charges are simply unfounded. Now, this is not to say that there are some people in the churches who are lax and loose with their standards and practices and weak in their devotion to God. Yes, that is true. There are some church members. But to characterize the whole body as if being an entirely an apostasy and totally backridden and backslidden, well, the fact of the matter is, that's not the case. And that is not safe to do that. It is not okay to blanket the entire church with one paintbrush because of the actions or the lack of actions of a few. Totally unjustified, totally unfair. Now, another punchline that they use is that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is Laodicea, and in its spiritual lukewarmness, God has spewed it out of his mouth. Another way of saying that, come join my movement because the church is messed up, well, let me remind you that the church is a hospital of souls, and this is where the sick are interned. Everyone has problems, everyone has fallen, everyone has a sinful human nature. Yeah, there is spiritual lukewarmness amongst the people of God, but that is no reason to say that he, God, has spewed out the entire body. Ashley Ellen G. White, she often refers to the fact that God's church will make it through to the end. God has not spewed out the entire church, and it just serves selfish purposes to say, hey, God has spewed out his church. Come join my holy movement. You see, it's self-serving and it's quite diabolical in its scheming. Now, when you look at uh, Revelation chapter 3 and you look at the Laodicean message, yeah, there's a Laodicean message there, but notice that it's a call to repentance. In Revelation chapter 3, it says here, I know thy works. I know thy works. Jesus knows the works. And Basically, you are neither cold nor hot, he says, and I wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. And because thou sayest I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and you are actually wretched and miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold, tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with thyself. So you see here that God is not spewing out his church here. It's a reformatory message where he's saying, look, I wish you were cold or hot. And so if you're neither cold nor hot, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. But the message doesn't stop there because he's saying, look, 
uh, here, buy this, get this, get that. So your life and your standards and your living changes. So it's not about, hey, uh, God has spewed the church out of his mouth. Actually, the message is a reformatory message. And it's a message that is actually written to God's end time church. Uh, Laodicea means the church of judgment. And we are living in the investigative judgment. And it applies to the whole church. And the church is going to go through to the end. So, of course, God is not going to reject his entire church. Yeah, there's going to be people shaken out, but he's not rejecting the entire thing. That is totally unfounded. God is changing lives in the church, and he is healing people as the great physician of their sin sickness in the church. Now, this brings me to the next one. Well, the church does not teach the truth of righteousness by faith. This is another charge. There are some people who get on the righteousness by faith bandwagon and hey, the righteous by faith message is essential. It's part of the third angel's message. But there are perversions, many perversions of it, and we must stick to the Bible on the righteousness by faith message. And of course, what Ellen G. White has written. So the church does teach the truth of the righteous by faith message. If you go through, I highly recommend you go through our fundamental beliefs. You can get a church manual or something else that has the fundamental beliefs, and you will see the doctrine of righteousness by faith given. You know, all the sections on basically growing, growing in faith, uh, receiving Christ as a personal savior, and receiving pardon and forgiveness, it's all there in our doctrine. So we do teach it. Whether people like it or not, the truth is the truth. We do. Now, God does not destroy is the character of God's message. That's another punchline. Now, the idea God does not destroy? What? If you look from Genesis to Revelation, you will find that God does visit the world and groups in judgment. As a matter of fact, Ellen White describes the final judgment, the executive judgment of the wicked as God's strange work. Yeah, it's strange to God because God is love and God is a creator, not a destroyer. Satan is the destroyer and, he, and he's the killer. But at the, ultimately, at the end of time, in God's presence, because God is an all-consuming fire, f that fire of God's presence is going to destroy the wicked. It's a strange work. And you know why the reason they get destroyed in the end is because they cherish sin. And sin, wherever cherished, gets destroyed in the presence of God. And so if we cling to sin, we will be destroyed along with it. The all-consuming fire of God's presence will consume us because we cling to sin. You see, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And so in the presence of God, darkness cannot abide. Sin cannot abide. Now, that is obviously a punchline refuted, right? Pretty clear? Now, the personal attainment, another punchline. The personal attainment of sinless perfection is a precondition for heaven. Now, to me, this one is an easy one to refute, just with common sense and logic. When we read um, Ellen G. White, we find that these reformers like Martin Luther and John Calvin and Knox and Zwingli and these other guys, you know, they didn't attain unto sinless perfection, but they're saved, okay? We know that. If you are a student of the spirit of prophecy and you understand these points and you understand even the righteous by faith message, you will know that those who... Uh, who, who, who basically have lived in the past and have lived up to all the light they had, they're saved. So sinless perfectionism as a precondition for heaven is simply just not the case. Yes, of course, we need the Holy Spirit to indwell in us. And when that spirit dwells in us, sin is removed and sin is vanquished. We need the righteous by faith message. And we need sin to be vanquished in our lives. We can't cherish sin, but we got to learn to hate it. You know, Paul in Romans, he talks about, well, I do the thing that I don't want to do, and the thing that I do want to do, I don't do. Basically saying he has this war between the spirit and the flesh, and this was continuing on in his life. So are we going to now say that um, all of a sudden Paul is now not saved? Because he clearly says he's battling with the flesh, and the things that he's wishing to do, he doesn't do, which are good, and the things that he uh, is doing, which are bad, he can't just stop doing. So all of a sudden, if we were to go off this, we would say Paul is lost. Now, some would argue and say, oh, he's not talking about himself. He's talking about X, Y, Z. Well, he's talking about somebody else, someone may argue. But it's clear in those texts that he's talking about himself. So would we dare say that Paul is lost because he's not uh, basically perfect, sinless perfect? Come on, give me an answer in the comment section down below. 
here's another punchline, and this is my last punchline I'm going to refute in this video, is that this is the truth. Christ was only human or that he had a sinful nature just like us. You see the danger there? Jesus' nature, this whole controversy, saying that Christ was only human makes him only, well, just a man. And then if he's just a man, well, all mankind can attain to godhood. You could also say that, well, if Christ had a sinful nature, just like us, then that would make him what? It would make him just a man. If Jesus had that sinful nature, he would not be a perfect sacrifice. And all throughout the Old Testament, we read about how essentially that sacrifice or that offering that typified the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who would take away the sin of the world, how that offering had to be perfect. And if Jesus is not that perfect offering, well, can he be an offering at all for our sins? No, obviously not. So to say that Jesus has had a sinful human nature is absolutely blown. That he had this sinful nature just like us. No, Ellen White makes it clear that he, his humanity was combined with divinity. And that humanity and divinity does not commit sin. The Bible says that he was without sin and without guile in his mouth. Jesus was sinless. Now who among us is sinless? None. So Jesus, he had the nature of man and the nature of divinity combined mysteriously. That is a mystery. That's something we're gonna to have to study in heaven and ask Jesus about because that is a deep topic and we only know what's revealed in scripture on that. And it's not that clear. Now, there are all these different offshoot groups, different ministries which are attacking and condemning the church. God has a bride his church and he is going to perfect it and have it ready for his soon return. We should not take this stance, this antagonistic stance against the church, because it is Christ's bride, he loves it, and he has paid with his precious blood her redemption. Yes, the church has some problems, but look at any church in this world. They all got problems, because guess what? They all have that same factor. You and me. And wherever you have you and me, there's problems because we all are broken and messed up and we all need changes in different areas in our lives. So wherever people are, there's problems. So if we're expecting somehow a holier than thou movement to rescue us, well, sorry, that day will never come. We all have this nature and this propensity to sin. We have all these problems. Yes, but Christ is going to perfect his church. He's going to perfect a people ready for translation, and it is an ongoing work. So let us pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, because that latter rain is going to ripen the harvest, and it's going to help us to be prepared and ready for the great crisis and Jesus Christ's soon return. Do you want to be ready for Christ's soon return? Then get ready, get ready, get ready by accepting Jesus as your personal Savior right now, today. How may you do that? Well, confess and forsake your sins and rely on Jesus as the one to save you, not yourself. And you will be ready for his soon return. Jesus loves you. Don't forget that. May God bless you and keep you until we study again.